Welcome to season two of Another Name for Everything, casual conversations with Richard Rohr, responding to listener questions from his new book, The Universal Christ, and from season one of this podcast. As mentioned previously, this podcast is recorded on the grounds of the Center for Action and Contemplation and may contain the quirky sounds of our neighborhood and setting. We are your hosts. I'm Bree Stoner. And I'm Paul Swanson. We're staff members of the Center for Action and Contemplation and students of this contemplative path, trying our best to live out the wisdom of this tradition amidst planting rose bushes, picking up another rotisserie chicken for dinner, and the shifting state of our world. This is the seventh of 12 weekly episodes. Today, we're diving into your questions on a theme that unites us all, the path of great suffering. So Richard, we're gonna uh, spend some time this episode talking about the path of great suffering. Um, And this was a very um, moving thing for Paul and I to read through so many questions and how vulnerable, honest, uh, and heartbroken so many of our listeners are and uh, we were just so grateful at the vulnerability that they were willing to extend to yes. us and sharing so much. So much of their, mail I get like that. Yeah. So to kick us off, uh, Carrie from Baltimore, Maryland says, as a person with a serious diagnosis, I valued what you said about dealing with your own health problems. It is scary and painful when a person's body does things they don't want it to do. My diagnosis is not life threatening, but it's still very sad for me. I cannot let myself devolve into, well, this is God's will for me, or even there's a lesson in this and I will learn to embrace it. That makes me cringe. I can't embrace this, but I would like to feel more at peace with my fears (coughs) and frustration. I hope you hear my grief and sadness in this and not an ego that is wounded. That's the other thing to set aside as I deal with this, the desire to control. Can you speak to how we can accept suffering without it becoming the trite response that it is God's will? It seems that the, the, the central suffering of suffering is the absurdity of it that there isn't an obvious lesson. <laughs> the nonsensical, there's no goal visible or obvious that you can find. And we're also, oh, if I had this purpose, I could achieve it. So she's so right. We try to put a spiritual purpose on it. Now, I'm not dismissing that spiritual purpose, but when it's too glib, too easily won, this is God's will for you in my generation is this is your cross to carry was our immediate Catholic answer. I don't think people grew from it so much. And it made God into a puppeteer who was always trying us with trials, not the entrance of love into our life, but the entrance of trial into our life. I don't know to what degree God is involved in in it, but we have to say, God certainly is allowing suffering, negativity, death. Why does God allow it? It seems that it's the the necessary pushback in the whole movement forward of, of personal evolution and historical revolution. There has to be loss, there has to be absurdity, there has to be tragedy, I mean, is there, is there a single novel that we take seriously that is not about tragedy in some way? And it's our dealing with that by which people come to depth, to wisdom, and to love. Now, does God maneuver that whole affair? I don't know. <laughs> I know many people afterwards say it feels like it, like I say that now after the several brushes with death I've gone through, I look back and I say, oh, you allowed it to come at just the right time, or uh, it wounded me just enough without destroying me so I can enjoy the grace of it, but it's always after the fact. When you're in the middle of it, 
It just feels like hell, yeah. inconvenience. Uh, why me? And you get into the self-pity thing real easily. Uh, but she's real upfront about this temptation. It's very sad for me. I cannot let myself devolve into this is God's will for me. Or even there's a lesson in this. She's avoiding glib religious responses. <clears throat> that means she's holding it rather than resolving it. And uh, as you well know, I've always seen the cross as the, as the holding, not the resolving. The very gesture of two nailed hands is I'm here with it, and then the women standing at the foot of the cross, not wailing, not uh, trying to protest, we, at least in the accounts we have, just standing there holding. It's a, a learning of the meaning comes from the holding itself, the time experience itself. And beyond that, I don't know what to say, except that the holy and wise and compassionate people I've met in my life have always gone through it, at least once, usually more than once. I so appreciate that she names um, that the other thing that she's learning to set aside in the midst of her suffering is the desire to control. Yes. And how suffering puts us in touch with how much of our lives we live with the illusion that we can create control or that we are in control. And it seems like that's one of the painful gifts of suffering is that it wakes us up to the recognition of, I can't change no. this, I'm not mm. in control. Yeah. I'm not in control. And so then I think mm. in some ways that answer, oh, well, it's God's will is almost like the human projection of like, well, if mm. we're not in control, somebody's mm. got to control this because otherwise how do I, how do I trust? How do I relax into it? Um, so it gives me compassion for that, the ways in which a lot of people, well-intentioned people, meaning well, will say things like that when you're going through suffering, like, oh, well, it must be God's will, or I'm sure that I'm sure this is this is gonna mean something one day, and you're when you're in it, that's not helpful. The existence yeah. of suffering in this world is very clearly saying God is not in control. Mm. And um, the fact that we projected that. God always was almighty, has done us a real disservice. And that's why for me, the cross is the symbol of God not being an almighty God, but an all-suffering God. Uh, it doesn't resolve it again, but it softens it. Mm -hmm. If God is participating with us in solidarity in the suffering, somehow, I can bear it. My grasp around it is softened. Yeah, yeah it's, that, it's that difference between what you were saying, Brie, right? The person who comes and, and says, this is God's will versus someone who comes and just sits with you yeah. in that tragedy yes, and just yes. not looking to resolve it for you, not looking to explain it away, but just sits in that grief with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's good. Continuing on this theme of suffering, Ross from Manhattan, Kansas asks, how do we think about suffering in the midst of a Christ-soaked world? Don't we just end up effectively saying that Christ animates suffering and bad as much as life and goodness? I'll tell you, that really fascinates me. I've never had anybody state it that way. Christ animates, that means give soul to, give soul to suffering and bad. I think he's right. Uh, I think he got it. Uh, of course, he's a Kansas boy. <laughs> We're always a few steps ahead of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> right down the road from where I grew up. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just learning from it as I read the words again and again. Aren't we effectively saying that Christ animates suffering and bad? He gives soul to it. That's what animation means. I think that's an interesting spin because when I first read it, I, I interpreted animates as is causing it. Oh. Which, which I, but, but I like the distinction you're making. And I think maybe that's the interesting spin that you're finding is that 
Oh. If we say animates as meaning give soul to or we I know Latin too much. Yeah. That's the reason. Please stop anima. being so smart. Yeah. <laughs> it's just not it became alma in yeah. Spanish. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It was anima in Latin. Right. Yeah. So that that makes sense to me. When you say if it's about giving soul to or weaving soul into, mm-hmm. I can feel Christ in oh, that. Oh, yeah. But if it's about causing, then... Mm-hmm. But I guess we don't really know what Ross meant, do we? <laughs> Which one? Can we call he him He might quick? mean what you said. Mm-hmm. But we don't want to say Christ causes suffering. He uses it Mm. and allows it. Mm. That would be my way of, if that's what he's asking. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, This next question is is painful and hard um, and I think illustrates so much of what we experience when we're in the midst of suffering. Uh, This is Nick from Australia. He says, The idea of resurrection in a universal way has been growing in me for years. I understand it and can even see it in life all around. Mm. It feels like I am in an extended holy Saturday since having to let go of my work as a school chaplain. I have a sense of lostness and of being outside my community. I also have a sense of blame and anger toward those who seem to ignore my sense of how chaplaincy could look outside traditional boundaries and box ticking. I still have to live in the same place and my kids go to the school, but I feel like I am broken. Mm. How does forgiveness set us all free here? How can I find a way forward that's not bitter or victimized? Where are you, resurrection? Wow. So how do you still find solace even when we feel isolated. Well, you can't self-engender consolation. You can hope for it. You can even intentionally choose it. Uh, But he seems to read himself very well. I'm in an extended Holy Saturday. Hmm. I can think of um, experiences where, particularly with communities, you know, churches where decisions are made um, that are painful or, you know, where maybe the church community takes a direction that's not the direction that you believed in or that feeling that he's describing a feeling like he's on the outside now and yet he still is, has to continue to be enmeshed in this community. Mm -hmm. I can feel the anguish that he's, Pointing He's toward. still in the middle of it. He yeah. is in Holy Saturday. But that he knows it yeah. mm-hmm. and could take a time to name it, admitting his own weakness. All the elements are there for resurrection. Mm. <laughs> it's just time now, it would seem to me. Uh, that The fact that he doesn't want to be bitter, can recognize the state of victimization as a dead end, I don't think he's going to end up there. That's easy for me to say. I'm an outsider. But uh, I can see why he was a chaplain. <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. But um, isn't it painful when it's the belief community? I take that to be the case. Maybe it was a, a Catholic school or Christian school that they are the ones who caused the pain. Yeah. Yeah. The cross is usually caused by your in-group, sometimes by the out-group. But, and, and I think that was the whole symbolism of Peter betraying him, Judas betraying him, the apostles running. That's the betrayal that hurts. Mm-hmm. I thought you were my friend. Other peoples who I get hate letters, you know, and people who I don't know, I don't care that much. It hurts for 10 seconds, but then I'm over it. But uh, the loneliness of suffering, uh, because those who I thought I was in union with, in fact, never really understood me. At least that's your fear. Then is there something wrong with me or what did I do wrong? He's going to go through all kind of levels of self-doubt, self-critique, anger, blame, the easy way uh, is to blame somebody else, but he's all already recognizing 
the need for forgiveness. Um, I, I think we, we have been very weak on teaching the, the absolute centrality of forgiveness to understanding the gospel. It's not you might need to do it. It's in this experience that you re-found uh, your life in a different place. Uh, you have to be betrayed at least once. I think so. If I can make a dogmatic statement, uh, <laughs> forgive me for sounding dogmatic. You have to be uh, used, hurt, wounded. That's the whole meaning of Jesus in his resurrected state in every gospel carrying his wounds. He's saying this is part of the deal. And we call that in men's work the sacred wound. The wound that is not projected elsewhere, is not used to feel sorry for the self, but becomes the way through. Mm. So he's, he's turning his wound into a sacred wound, yeah. I think. Yeah, you can, you can really hear the anguish. And I think about those seasons of life where there is that betrayal, and then also your prayer even hurts because mm. it's just longing, mm. it's just groaning, mm. right? That's and you can good, Paul. Hit the way he even names it, the uh, Holy Saturday. Of, yeah, is is Liminal. Easter Sunday ever going to come? Right. Mm. And, yeah. Mm. Right. Speaking to that longing, um, in our previous episode when we were spending some time talking about embodiment, and I feel like we're very anemic in understanding the ways in which grief is very physical as well, and for that reason, seem to not remember that we need to take care of our bodies while we're going through experiences of deep grief and suffering and how important it becomes to you to, to move your body, to go for a walk, to feel connectivity with more than just what has happened to you. You know, I mean, I, I know Cynthia tells a story, Cynthia Bourgeau tells a story of her teacher sending her out to just chop wood. No, now you need to go chop wood and making that a spiritual practice of conscious labor, of moving the body, of breathing, of doing something physical, um, of exerting yourself a little bit as a recognition that this vessel that you're in is also experiencing the grief. Um, I don't know. I feel like I, I really wish in the moments of great anguish in my life, I wish that I had had more people pointing me toward the body. and Because in a way, it's like not trying to solve it, but just another way to be with, another way to be in that liminal space. Yeah. So you hear about animals, right? After they go through a traumatic oh, experience, right. they'll lay down and shake. Shake. Um, because Birds will shake. Yeah. Shake it off. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. So helpful. And here's a question that I think uh, made both Bree and I weep from Doug in Ames, Iowa. He says, thank you for these tremendous podcasts and for everything you do for so many people. After one has experienced tremendous loss in one's life and is blessed with the opportunity to hit a low point, how does one continue to stay low, so mm. to speak? <clears throat> oh, beautifully put. I'll elaborate a little bit more from my standpoint. We lost our... For our a month. We lost our four-month-old son, Ben, to a terrible disease, had our rainbow daughter, Carolyn, about eight months later, only to find Carolyn has oh, the same terrible no, disease Ben had, no. which is pulmonary vein stenosis. Carolyn lives today at almost three and a half years of age, truly as a testament to God's healing grace. My journey through this brought me so far down into such a place of helplessness, especially after we found out Carolyn had PVS that I had felt my heart open up to so many. My empathy improved so, so much. However, our society, media, and life in general challenges me to keep this open heart of mine as open as I'd like it. How do we humans focus to do the work to sustain this open-heartedness? Again, thank you for all you do and how you've helped so many, including me. God, that he has enough space in his heart to want to thank me <laughs> at the beginning and the end when he's gone through so much. How do we keep it? I hope this doesn't sound like a glib answer. 
but uh, you've heard me say that the fruits of love and suffering can only be maintained by some contemplative practice. So he's been brought low. He doesn't want to lose what he's learning there, and he's absolutely right in that. So unless he can uh, find something to protect the natural tendency for his heart to close down, to become cynical. To, and, and then you see people worried about lesser things or seeking power and money and fame and all of it just seems so superficial and selfish. Because you've gone through this transformative experience, it's very easy to get righteous and judgmental about people who are, you think you have something to cry about? You know, that mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. attitude. Yeah. And you're right, but don't go there. <laughs> uh, and you've got to notice when you're doing that. My suffering is greater than your suffering. And it is probably. But don't let it become a weapon. Don't let it become a uh, ammunition to make yourself the enlightened one by reason of I've suffered greater. Uh, I don't see that anywhere in his uh, language here, but since he's asking, how do I keep this heart space open? Those will be the temptations to harden, harden his heart. Uh, very often, it doesn't, I hope this isn't the case either, but maybe you've heard very often when couples lose a child, they take it out on one another. Yeah. They're both hurting so much. They've lost so much together. And again, that scapegoat mechanism has to go somewhere. So that'd just be one warning I'd give. Uh, don't, I hope we don't lose Caroline too. But um, when couples find themselves with the children out of the room, can you imagine the tendency to just, if only you had, I haven't been married, but I would think you would do that. So it's just a warning with no indication that, that uh, what's his good name? Doug, Doug would do that. Mm -hmm. And what does that look like for you, Richard, knowing that we're all inundated with so much of the suffering in the world? How do you help keep that space open in, in your own heart to, to be able to, to, to let that impact you and, and how you participate in the world and serve and love others? I honestly feel just last night watching the news, like I'm doing it less and less well. Mm. It's just how much absurdity can the world carry? Every single story on the local news and the national news is of human cruelty. <laughs> and gratuitous human cruelty. Just people going in and shooting up stores. And where is this coming from? Has it always been that way? Has it always been the gratuity of it? Killing people that you don't even know. You don't even have a grudge against. But my inner wound and anguish is so great, I've got to take it out on an anonymous object. I don't understand it. And again, there's no, uh, very often, not always, the people in power, at least on last night's news, in the army or in the police force, were just as bad as the victims. <laughs> so it's not like one side's always glorious and the other side is always terrible. It's like this poison is everywhere. Uh, so I'm not... Uh, my prayer this morning was just uh, show me how to draw upon a deeper love. I choose to draw upon a deeper love because it isn't coming to me naturally right now. There's a anger at the world. Uh, our mistreatment of refugees, our mistreatment of almost everybody but white rich people. <laughs> I mean, it's coming down to that. Mm -hmm. What has the land of the free, the home of the brave become? Uh, yeah. 
I'm not, I'm showing you that I'm not dealing with it very well right now. Um, yeah, I'm feeling, I'm feeling heartbroken, mind broken by what the world has become in my lifetime. Because I grew up in the 60s where it was all the opposite. It was all, everything's getting better and better and better. And it was so hopeful, Vatican II, civil rights movement, anti-war movement. And now here we are in white privilege and racism all over again. Mm. It's heartbreaking. So I hope I'm not adding to your pain. Uh, but this must have been the absurdity that not just Jesus himself felt, but the 12 and the women. And it's come to this? Mm. Were we just kidding ourselves? I, that's the terrible. And I've had those thoughts. Am I just creating a, a wishful thinking worldview in all my books and talks about resurrection and grace and love? Am I just whistling in the dark? I, I, I do think that sometimes. And then I get even more hopeless mm -hmm. that this is all a made-up story that I'm using to convince myself. Um, yeah. I think that points to the... Um, I think you're embodying the importance of owning grief and doubt as part of the process of resurrection that to just glibly try to bypass or jump over or dismiss or um, downplay the very real suffering that's somehow woven into the fabric of this cosmos would would be to deny it would be to deny this very cosmos would be to somehow mm. not participate in it and yes. i think there's well something about grief at this level of suffering. I think about Doug and it's like, he has Carolyn now to look to mm. in, this, in this way of appreciating the miraculous. What, a, what an absolute lens cleanser, yeah. where so much of us are living entitled and blind, um, unaware of all the privileges that we take for granted. You know, here's Doug and he's got this this child that now reminds him on a daily basis and his grief of the loss of his son to live from a level of, I want to stay awake. How do I stay awake? How do I not miss this? Um, and it's deeply moving for me. It makes me think how much more we need to be listening to the suffering. Mm -hmm. We need to be listening to those on the margins. Mm -hmm. We need to be paying attention to those who are fully awake because their grief has made them so. There's this essay by this author, Silas House, and the title, which I love so much, is The Grief of Loving You. Oh. The Grief of Loving. And I just think that's just, it just is an epithy oh, so connection together, of it all, right? Yeah. Oh. Tracy from Charlottesville, Virginia, says, my question is probably one of theodicy. How do you explain when great suffering results in a person decompensating or narrowing? being essentially spiritually or emotionally destroyed. My mom was mentally ill. She died a month ago. Great suffering contributed, contributed to her jettisoning community and becoming more narrow and dualistic. How am I fortunate enough to find suffering transformative, but the same seems to irreparably damage others? That is so true. The same suffering I've met in the same family, two kids, will have absolutely different responses to the same absurdity, whatever it might be. And she's seeing it. Must be very painful that it was her own mother. I don't, is one of theodicy. And as you know, theodicy is the whole science of, of God and suffering, God and death. How it, I don't, it seems like it'll never stop. But I keep coming back to, we can't keep thinking of God as almighty. Mm. That's what creates so much of the problem. 
Now I know logically, rationally, isn't that what it means to be God? To have gotten this whole thing started and to be in control of everything. Why does this apparition of a suffering God come into our lens? And we call it Christianity. But Christianity still mostly teaches uh, an absolute, omniscient, omnipotent God. And uh, it, it does seem to be the, the event of suffering is what separates uh, people into the line of enlightenment and the line of disillusionment. Now, I, I, here's what I want to say for sure. Those who are disillusioned by it, that doesn't mean they're lost. It doesn't mean they're going to hell. It doesn't mean God doesn't love them. But they apparently <clears throat> have missed a, a major opportunity to enjoy God, life, love now. <clears throat> They've put it off for a while, for whatever reason. So maybe that helps a little bit too, to not think that your mother, if she was mentally ill, uh, something had come into her life that she could not handle, that she could not process. God must understand that 10 times more than we do, why her mind could not deal with something. And of course, of course, it might have been a physiological something too. But at any rate, it's certainly no reason for dismissal uh, or, or uh, exclusion or pity for her mother. I, I don't hear her doing that. Well, it does say she jettisoned community and became more narrow. So I, I guess that's her pain to, to see what her mom did. It is painful that what she, what she brings up um, is the, the reality that sometimes it seems like arbitrarily even, suffering will make one person yeah. open up mm -hmm. more and soften mm -hmm. up more and be more uh, vulnerable. And for other people, it seems to shut them down more, harden them, spiral out more. Um, and I can feel the loss of control in that question. Like, yes. why is that? We can, I don't, mm. what, you know, what causes that? What, you know, it reminds me of that story I was telling about the tree falling in the yard. It's like, well, what, what made it live and what made it die? Like, what made it go this way and not that way? And I can feel the anguish of not knowing, uh -huh. just not knowing what causes some people to open and some people to shut down. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I just had th this image of this guy met when I was on this, this long time ago, but he had done a few tours on Iraq. And when I was there, when his mother asked him about that experience, and he said, those experiences are in a box in the back of my brain that I have locked and will never open the key because it was so painful. And so to mm. know what, how does that suffering, how has that locked him down? Or to have uh, friendships with others who have served, um, like there's a vet who comes to morning sit sometimes and we're, his own experiences have opened him up in that way. Like, how does war mm. have that yeah. that impact on people where someone can't even like begin to heal from that, and yeah. another can have that brokenness turn into mm. something transform a pathway towards transformation? Mm. Like, I just it's the absurdity. If I had another lifetime, uh, I would love to seriously. Uh, create liturgies of lamentation mm. where experiences like this, there has to be a place where they can be publicly named, grieved. Now, this has emerged in the secular world with these discussion groups, sharing groups, support groups, 12-step groups, uh, now restorative justice groups. Yeah. So the secular world is discovering it because the church hasn't. It's again how the Spirit works. We miss our vocation to heal and to know how to lament because our job was to forgive sin, not really to heal the wounds of sin. At least that's the way Catholic priests saw their job. Yeah. Uh, liturgies of lamentation are the next stage in church growth, I think. One, one facet. 
I think one of the things that your book, The Universal Christ, um, is opening up for us is maybe a, a step toward that healing of recognizing, okay, if we're all in this body of Christ, if we're all in this together, that idea that we've been talking about, then that nothing is lost or wasted. Mm. It gives me a, a place where I can grieve what I can't understand about some of the losses in my own life of why did that have to happen or why this and not that, or why did this person shut down and not open up? It's, it gives me a place to hold that and say, they're still, th they're still in this. We're still in this together. Um, nothing of their life was lost or wasted. Mm -hmm. It, it just begins that converse. It begins that movement for me to rest in the universal Christ, to rest in this knowledge or belief that we really are all in this together and that somehow we're not losing, nothing's falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. No one is falling through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That tees up this next question so well um, from an anonymous friend that connects to one of the, the patterns that you laid out in the book, Richard. They say, after thinking for a bit, I wonder now if the rising numbers of those who suffer from anxiety, depression, and other mental health issues, as well as the higher and higher rates of suicide, relate to a feeling of being stuck in the second box. Oh, yes. In the disorder. <clears throat> How do we help those stuck in that place of disorder, especially to the extent that they are hopeless enough to harm themselves and invite them into a reordering, into the, incarna into the incarnational way, especially those who maybe were never given an order and are constantly grasping to get there. First thing that hits me in, in hearing that is um, whoever wrote it, the, they get the, that analysis. Uh, order, disorder, reorder. How do you help people who are trapped in disorder and revel in disorder? That's much of America today, certainly the youth culture. As much as I praise the millennials, so many of them almost have disdain for anything that is order. Disdain. Don't you dare try to tell me there's, there's a level of order. And until they get over that disdain for order, and I've got to add to it, if this sounds self-serving, forgive me, disdain for authority, leadership, tradition. Uh, I will not allow there to be good eldering. I will not allow there to be good tradition. In fact, I will do my best to tear it down. Uh, you can just see them sitting there waiting to shoot you down. How dare you say there's meaning. Uh, that's your meaning. Uh, and I refuse to accept that's meaning because it's just your meaning and your group. And they're half right. But what is this resistance to meaning? You, you follow the point I'm making? Yeah. I've experienced this with so many people. Uh, and in my generation, too, it just takes different issues. That they're afraid you're putting legalism or church attendance back on them. That's not what you're saying at all. Um, so to, to submit to a, a fundamental childlike, and I'm intentionally using the word, child, word childlike, order, uh, that makes the world okay, is a huge leap of humility for modern people, even more for postmodern people. No, there, it, don't you dare tell me. I will not be naive. I will not be used again. I believe that stuff once. And I can really understand that. <clears throat> but they're trapped in this reveling in cynicism, reveling, uh, reveling in the, the demon of dismissal. It's so superior to dismiss things. Just sit there, one thing after the other. And uh, when you can stop doing that, I'm not telling you to be naive, but I am inviting you into a second naivete. It's different than the first naivete. I know all the absurdity. I'm willing to struggle 
with the nonsensical character of everything, I've been hurt myself, and I still opt for life and love and goodness. That's reorder. Uh, I mean, he or she is really asking the big question for this period of, of history. In most of previous history, is how, and Jesus' lifetime, how do we get people out of the box of order, which was legalistic and unreal and impossible, and get them out of order. <laughs> uh, now it's get them out of disorder. So seems like we've lost a lot of the. I think part of what I'm what I'm locating is part of the the causal point of so much of the anxiety and depression in our time is the loss of the institutions that used to create coherence for us that used to allow us to have a would give us a healthy coherent worldview and so with the decline of those institutions with the decline of that this um, um fragmentation of our worldview that you're talking about this postmodern the uh, everything is relative. There's no one truth. There's no one thing. There's no universal message. Um, has left many of us feeling like I can't go back to the belief system of my childhood because that was too narrow. That was that's first naivete. And and um, I'm stuck in the sense of disorder of like, well, that didn't work, and I know that doesn't <laughs> fit anymore. But I think many of us have been hungering for a. I, I want to believe in a coherent worldview, but I need it to incorporate more than the first one did. And that's, I think this is part of this movement with this teaching in the universal Christ is, I think from a theological standpoint, we really need more coherent worldviews that encompass cosmology and positive anthropology, you know, because otherwise we got, we've got nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. We stay stuck in this disorder place because we can't fit in the shoes that we outgrew of the more narrow faith-based mm -hmm. coherences, well, the coherence that we yes. grew up with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so speaking to that kind of collective universal view and coherent making um, paradigm, Peter from Lund Can oh, I just say, you, yeah. something you said just really struck me regarding just meaning is struggle, right? It's strug It's a struggle to live a meaningful life or to find meaning mm -hmm. in a way where, um, as you said, it was being handed on before, like this is the meaning that you should aspire to or connect to, yeah. and that's been let go of. But it's, we're now, it seems to be in that midst of, of trying to reframe meaning and trying to relate to it in a new way, and it is going to be struggle. Like mm -hmm. it's not gonna, our previous history of having to be an easy meaning that was given to us no longer works, and now we're, blazing our own trail of 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 the struggle of 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 meaning in a way that we potentially haven't had to do before when we were growing up because it was handed to us so it is a new yes a new mm -hmm. practice for those yes. of us who are seeking a new way of mm -hmm. uh connecting to a coherent universe yeah oh yeah and it almost seems as though the meaning we're learning to live into now is one of process yeah which is yeah. Which is how when, what I hear you say, like God is in this with us. Yeah. Therefore, it's not we can't just jump ahead to an outcome of heaven or hell. It's how do we how do we trust meaning in the midst of not knowing, which is much harder. Much harder. <laughs> much harder. So Peter from London asks, uh, you you talk about suffering, including mentioning the three wonderful Jewish women, Eddie Hilsom, Simone Weil, and Anne Frank. I understand how my suffering connects me to the world and that God suffers too. It is new to me to think about how I can help God with God's suffering. Could you please explain this a little bit more? It's an astounding concept, isn't it? I, I think it, it demands a, a high degree of love. Uh, now, as long again as God is the puppeteer and the Almighty One, and we are the victims of His choices, and He is usually a He uh, in that paradigm, to actually be so in connection with this God that you can allow God to be vulnerable before His own creation, not suffering for it, but in it. Change the preposition. This is, as you know, why I'm so hard on the atonement theory. 
And people wonder why, because it, it was all God is suffering for, which really kept the subject and the object split. We were the object of God's suffering and the cause of it in many of our churches. Your sin causes God's suffering. Do you see how this is 10 levels beyond that? To say, I, I just want to lessen God's pain. Uh, and the only way I can do that is, as Paul says in Colossians, to make up in my own body that all Christ still has to suffer. So you can, that's the most clear line uh, for the sake of, of the whole body. But uh, you only see that in, in rare people. But it, it, the reason I had to mention it in this book is because here they are all women and all Jewish. <laughs> and it's sort of a necessary humiliation to Christians who never think of God as suffering in them and with them, although we should have been given that direct lesson from the cross. But instead, we made the cross into a transaction. Dang it. Uh, once it's a transaction, it, the the distance between God and the soul is maintained. Oh, he's being nice to us, but he's not with us and in us, like us. That's what the cross was meant to say to humanity. God is in us, with us, like us, not just for us. So the for us was celebrating oh, the magnanimity of God, which we're all grateful for. I'm not throwing out the for us, but when it's limited to that, you know, if that's why you, you outgrow your parents in a way. I like mother always helping me, but how wonderful it's going to be when your kids come back to you as adults and you can walk at their side and let them give to you. Oh, that must be a wonderful experience, huh? That I don't have to be the helper, he wants to help me. So once you state it at that level, it makes total sense. So it tells me that, that Eddie and Simone and Anne Frank were at that level. Of I'm gonna help God back now. This is adult Christianity, even though it's ironically adult Judaism. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't say ironic because we're a child of Judaism. And I love to say it that way. We're a child of Judaism. And just as maybe a, a small percentage of Jews got it, but most of the prophets, that's the level they were at. They wanted to lessen the suffering of God by t telling Israel how stupid it was. <laughs> Join with me in lessening the suffering of God by healing the world. Oh, it's just high level love. And uh, I bet you as adults with your own parents, isn't it nice to go home and do something for dad or mom in their old age? Oh, it was such a delight. When, I mean, my dad drove me all my life and loved cars and was a good driver when he was such an old man that he couldn't drive well, and I got to drive him. I just felt so, oh, this is so neat. <laughs> Why was that so neat? I don't know, except finally the playing field of love is somehow equaled. Mm -hmm. And that's the equality of lovemaking that Jesus gave us through the incarnation. That we matter, our love matters, our giving matters, and God wants us and allows us to give back to God. And apparently God takes some kind of delight from that, mm -hmm. as you will from your kids. Mm -hmm. A whole different kind of delight. And as you take when you give it to your parents. Mm -hmm. Thank you for centering in on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's one of my, for me, one of my more central points in the book. The big fancy word for that in theology was patripassionism. The father suffers. And at a certain point, I think it was in the first millennium of Christianity, 
Patripassianism, I don't know if I'm even pronouncing it right, was condemned. You may not say that the Father suffers. Only Jesus suffered. See, I think that was wrong. Someone who was teaching Patripassianism was right. It's a suffering God. Jesus is not different than the Father. The Father is not different than the Spirit. They learn it from one another. The whole Trinity is the suffering of God. Jesus just makes, or Christ, in Jesus, just makes it visible, tangible, touchable, so forth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. To kind of set up our closing, um, I found that for whatever reason, I have a place that I tend to fall apart, which is my kitchen floor. Uh, I, I don't know if it's because that's usually when the kids are in bed and they're down and I'm cleaning up the kitchen. That is the point in the day when if I'm experiencing grief, I can finally let it out. Um, and I'm fascinated by the relationship of that point when we finally break down and are finally vulnerable enough to cry, to weep, that those are the moments of my most honest prayers where it's just bare heart to God asking for help without any eloquence mm. whatsoever. And with a deep recognition of my own brokenness, my own imperfections, my own um, faults, as well as uh, my own grief that I carry. Uh, so so that as a setup to our question, I, I, I wondered if, Richard, if you, <laughs> you <laughs> I don't know if you have a place that... Um, a place. A place, well, a place where you break down and maybe what your most recent um, kitchen floor moment has been. You know, it's so funny. I have a niece who years ago uh, shared an almost exact thing. She had one of her children, she had five children, uh, who just would not stop crying. Mm. Morning, afternoon, and night. Can you imagine? Well, you can as, as a mother. The sense of helplessness. What am I doing wrong? And she told me one night how she finally got this little boy to go to sleep. And she just fell on the kitchen floor in front of the refrigerator and just sobbed. (laughs) Just sobbed in a complete mess of (laughs) helplessness. I remember so feeling for her. What could I say? What could I do? But have I had any such experience? You know, uh, the place in my little house, my little hermitage, where I live, um, the, the exact spot where I had the heart attack, is, is my prayer place. That's where I sit and have it. And I was sitting there. I thought I was having a holy experience. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Only you, Richard. Only you. Your heart you. was on fire. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm on fire. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, and then it, when it got painful, it didn't go away. <laughs> I, I waited about 30 minutes, and then I called a staff member. I think I might be having a heart attack. <laughs> uh, since then, that has become the place where it's safe for me to feel almost anything. Mm. Self-hatred, self-pity. Uh, it's really safe. Uh, and I keep thinking another heart attack is going to happen in the same spot. The way your mind works is silly. Uh, but uh, it's like I died here once, <laughs> as it were. Mm-hmm. And then I didn't die. Uh, they drove me to the uh, emergency room, uh, even correcting me all the way. Uh, don't you call an ambulance next time? Well, I don't want to die in an ambulance. I want to die with a friend mm-hmm. next to me. Uh, so it all worked out. But because I went through that whole thing, uh, my kitchen floor is this place in my little house where, and this is just a recent experience, mm-hmm. where I, I passed over somehow from death to life. And ironically, that seems like a safe place now. Mm-hmm. Well, I did it here once. I can do it again. It's very unusual. I was sitting there this morning. I do almost all mornings. Mm-hmm. So... I don't know if that's an answer. No, Thank it you. is. It's a beautiful Thank you, answer. Richard. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. You're welcome. Thank you for asking such good, 
juicy questions. Also, <laughs> I, I really hope that you don't have a um, spiritual heart experience anytime soon. <laughs> just for a little bit longer. <laughs> just, just Thank you. <laughs> and that's it for today's episode of Another Name for Everything with Richard Rohr. This podcast is produced by the Center for Action and Contemplation. Thanks to the generosity of our donors. The beautiful music you're listening to is provided by Bird Talker. If you're enjoying this podcast, consider rating it, writing a review, or sharing it with a friend to help create a bigger and more inclusive community. To learn more about Father Richard and to receive his free daily meditations in your electronic mailbox, visit cac.org. To learn more about the themes of the Universal Christ, visit universalchrist.org. From the high desert of New Mexico, we wish you peace and every good.